Totally Football Show, European edition. Today, Rodri, Ballon d'Or. Mario, Balotelli. Kenny Hitter, Barn d'Or. Kylian Mbappe, Do. El Clasico, Le Classique. And Ten Hag, Out the Door. It's all coming up in this Totally Football Show. Tuesday, 29th of October. Look around the studio. Who have we got? James Horncastle. Hello. Nice, nice salute you gave me there. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Julien Laurent. Hello. <laughs> Lovely hello as well. Lovely hello. Uh, that's not all, is there? You'll be glad to know. Uh, we've got uh, Seb Stafford Bloor on the way. Paul Balus, of course. Big week in Spain and for Spanish football in general. Also, David Novo, executive editor of the uh, top Portuguese football paper record. I wonder what he'll be talking about. Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. Hey, Jules. Yes. Paris, Monday night. Wow. Ballon d'Or. Théâtre du Châtelet. Oui. It's a lovely theatre, isn't it? Yeah, nice. Yeah. Did look nice. Never yeah. looked lovelier, I would say, with all the football's great and good assembled, yeah. apart from Real Madrid. I had two empty seats in the front row. And Jules wasn't there. Jules wasn't there. I could not go. I was invited by a French radio <laughs> show. No, you didn't even need to tell us No, that. no, I, was just, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew. I'm surprised they went ahead with the event. Did That's Xabi right. Alonso tap you on the shoulder and said, no, nah, I'm not going either, Jules? <laughs> We kind of, we maybe, we maybe took the decision together. Right. Yeah. Uh, the man who beat him in the uh, Europa League final was there, wasn't he? Uh, Rodri? No, no, in the Europa League final, the manager. Ah, Gasp. Yeah, yeah. Gasparini, Gasp, yeah, of course. yeah. Gasp. Yeah, looking smart. I think Gasp had a good shot at winning that trophy. I agree. Mm. But he wasn't Spanish because every single winner, I think, was Spanish or Spanish football orientated. Let's have a look. Rodri got the yeah. Ballon d'Or. And we can discuss the merits thereof in a second or two. But the women's Ballon d'Or went to fellow Spaniard Aitana Bonmati of Barca Feminine. Yeah. Uh, Lamine Yamal of Barcelona got the uh, Trofeo Copa, the best yeah. young player. Best women's club was Barcelona. Best manager was Ancelotti of Real Madrid. And best club was Real Madrid. Michael Cox, yeah. taking an unusually contrary view on this one. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> he says. I realise some people dislike individual awards in football. Fair enough, but an award for best club is clearly much sillier. That's what the actual sport is for. I have to say, I agree with Michael. <laughs> yeah, that, this this one of the new ones, the best clubs, yeah. which I don't know. I don't know whether this didn't fit your narrative, mm. but Emmy Martinez, the Argentine, who oh. does speak Spanish, because right. that's what they do in Argentina. He won the oh. Yashin Award. Yes, he so. was a one outlier, or not? Well, no, because he speaks Spanish. Yeah. Spanish I'm sure, is his yeah. mother tongue. But otherwise, a clean sweep for for Spanish football. And it, uh, of course, involved Ro uh, Vinicius not getting a widely predicted Ballon d'Or. Ballon d'Or. Ballon d'Or. <laughs> Ballon d'Or. <laughs> Did you see in the Classico <laughs> when he had uh, an argument with Gavi towards the end? Yeah. Now, is anyone absolutely sure? Because the suggestion is that he'd say, yeah. I may be losing, but I'm going to get the Ballon d'Or yeah. tomorrow. But other people have said that's not what he said. Yeah, I don't know if it is true or not. Mm. You would not pa put it past him that it's not something that he would say. Mm. But in the same way, why I bring this up is because Real Madrid TV had planned a five-hour live show right. to celebrate Vinicius Ballon d'Or. Right. And surely, and you also pay the rights for being at the Ballon d'Or if you're a TV channel. Mm. There's no way Real Madrid would have put all those plans in place if at some point they have, haven't been told that Vinicius were going to win it, right? right? Because if you don't know, if there's uncertainty, if, if, if you know Rodri is a possibility or Haaland, whoever else, you don't put all of that together, right? And, and are ready to send everybody in Paris having this massive five-hour live show. So I don't know if something happened and if they thought he had won it and mm. then they didn't go because they were so upset that at some point somebody, someone told them, yes, it's him make sure that you get everything. Mm. But I don't know, it's a bit weird. Intrigue. Not a yeah. great look for Real Madrid, though, no. not turning up for their award. And also, indeed, like, not even congratulating uh, Rodri. Uh, it, it, quite the contrary. Uh, Vinicius uh, tweeting afterwards, I'll, I'll do it times 10 if I need to. They are not ready. Does that mean, yeah, say, like, Ballon d'Or 10 times? I think, uh, in I a work 10 media. times harder. <laughs> work 10 times harder. No, but like, we're going to try 10 times harder. I guess what yeah. this also means is that if you're Kylian Mbappe, you're never getting another pass from... <laughs> or Jude Bellingham. <laughs> but but yeah. after Spain won the Euros, there were reports that Real Madrid wanted Rodri or they want Rodri at some stage in the future mm. and that, you know, he can be the person who can balance that midfield once Modric yeah. leaves. Obviously, Kroos has retired. I thought Kroos had a really good shout to win the Ballon d'Or. 
and I think ended up finishing like eighth. Um, and now, like, if they do want Rodri at some stage in the future, isn't it going to be a bit awkward? <laughs> like, you know, we didn't send anyone uh, to the Ballon d'Or that you won. We didn't congratulate you. Um, you know, we did this kind of protest. Uh, really pathetic uh, from from Madrid now. Like, in yeah, terms of just, like, on poor. a very spa- basic sporting level, just kind of, you know, applaud the winner. Yeah. Know. You know, take your runners-up medal. Don't do what take people do medicine. these days, which is, you know, you get a runners-up medal and you take it off. Cause it's, I yeah, mean, it's they've like, got three players up. in the top five, don't they? Or four in the top five. Is that right? Vinicius, Bellingham, Carvajal. Carvajal. And, they, yeah, and the so thing is, Madrid were, were so good, they probably split the vote. This is the yeah, issue. Yeah, that's why he didn't win, exactly. You like know. Liverpool in uh, the season they won the Champions League because right. Van Dijk, Salah and Mane, one of them surely deserved it and they the votes were split in their favour they took some votes away from each other and that was it yeah. Yeah. I'm happy for Rodri that he won it he deserves most it most important player and the most consistently good football absolutely. team absolutely two incredible year. years back to back he deserves it too and I think Vini also would have been a, a worthy winner mm. the line from Real Madrid was like the Ballon d'Or doesn't respect Real Madrid so Real Madrid <laughs> doesn't go where it's not respected I see Okay. but the best line of the night I don't know if you saw Ruth Gullit on oh, French yeah. television uh, I don't know if Ruud Gullit has a phone or if he has this the, the old Nokias, you know, with no apps, no smartphones. But he said, yeah, Vinicius is going to win, I'm sure. And that was like half seven. <laughs> <laughs> he must have been the only guy in the Théâtre du Châtelet not knowing that Vinicius was not coming <laughs> because he didn't want. And Gullit was like, yeah, 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 Vinicius surely is the best player in the world. Ruud didn't get the memo. Can you imagine the shock? Like, I, I like... <laughs> We know so much about everything these days that it's difficult to be shocked. But maybe <laughs> like analog and rude. And on his chest. <laughs> it's just like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Next time. Ah. Next year. Excellent. Uh, that was Monday night. At the, what was the name of the theater, Jules? <laughs> Théâtre du Châtelet. The, the Moulin Rouge. In the Châtelet area. Like right. proper central Paris. Uh, look forward to more of that next year. But let's leave the Ballon d'Or for now. And have a moment of the week before we get into all the league stuff and that. Mm. Uh, James, you're up. Oh, right, great. I mean, it has to be the Derby d'Italia, no? It was one of the games Which of the season. Moment, yeah. Is it Francisco Conceição with that incredible oh, stutter? Oh, and yeah. then the scatto. What a player. I mean, Christian Vieri was doing uh, sideline for Dizon, who had the rights in Italy. And he was like joking around before the game saying he was texting his old mate, Sergio Conceição, because they used to be teammates. I can't remember whether it was at Inter or Lazio. And he was saying, your, your son's so much better than you. You know, you couldn't even put a cross in the box. And, um, I mean, Conte Sao put in one of those performances where you're just like, wow. Like, in terms of dribbling, taking players on, like, everything, like, people think Federico Chiesa is. Like, this guy did, like, it times 10, to use Vinicius's tweet kind of mm. thing. Like, unplayable. Mm. Yeah. I mean, involved in, what, three of their four goals? And, like, the, the equaliser, which came in, what, the 82nd minute? Yeah, he is, he's probably attempted maybe, I don't know, 15 dribbles at that stage. He goes again when he should be absolutely exhausted, yes, digs out the, the cross. Energy. Incredible. Um, doesn't really look like his dad at all either. And mm. he's tiny. He's the little small, man. Yeah. <laughs> the little man. Yeah. Il folletto. <laughs> you know, yeah. just like, um, so there was that. There was Yildiz coming off the bench, yeah. which was the big call at the beginning of the game. It was like, hang on a minute. You're not playing the new Juventus number 10. You've dropped him for the biggest game of the season. And Thiago Motta, because he had to do some pre-match uh, flash interviews, was like, don't worry. You know, like, I know I'm going to use him. I'm going to bring him on. We're going to play him in different positions, gives us a different option. He, he brings him on, starts him on the left. He gets them back into the game uh, to make it, what, 2-3 for Juventus. 2-4, uh, 3-4, four, four, sorry. And then um, and then he scores the equalisers at, playing as a centre forward. I mean, yeah, magnificent game. And Inter were brilliant as well. Inter should have won you know, comfortably. Should have scored maybe five or six. Didn't. Um, and we got the game of the season. Boom. So, yeah. Jules, anything you'd I like to really add to be, that? I can't, uh, it was amazing to watch. And the good thing was it was early enough that you could yeah. watch it uh, in the afternoon uh, just after the start of the Arsenal-Liverpool game. So it was great. I, lo- I loved it. And if there was a feeling that um, I felt Juventus were always in it, in a mm. way, if, even when mm. they were 4-2 down. And I, and I just, I love that. So I love to see the Turan brothers, two on the yeah. pitch, not, nice. not for long because yeah. Kefren came on late and then Marcus came off not long after. But I, th- I thought that was still beautiful. 
What about in France, Jules? So my, my pick this weekend is Angers getting the first win mm. because, uh, you know, we always we often talk about big clubs, which is normal. But finally, uh, they won a game, which mm. is great for them. They beat Saint-Etienne uh, 4-2, the two promoted sides, which means that in Italy, everybody has won. In Spain, everybody has won. In England, we still have three teams that haven't won and two in Germany. So uh, in is France, right? everybody has won, yeah. Good Lord. Imagine right. one day in the future if Ange Postecoglou were to coach Angers. <laughs> yeah. like um, Arsenal at Arsenal, no? Yeah. It's a bit like that, yeah. yeah. And Wolf, Wolfgang or uh, Wolfsburg. Yes. Mm. Yeah. I don't think you can beat that one. Oh, <laughs> Milan Mandarich. No, oh Milan, my God. Milan, Milan, Milan Mandarich. Oh, no, he was a, yeah, he was that's known pretty good. Like, yeah, but he could be still, a, you know, I don't know. Own Milan, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's get a moment of the week and a juicy one from Paul Belus. Paul Belus, yeah, yeah. your moment of the week. I would say that my mo moment de la semana, mo moment of the week, um, was against was the game between Barcelona and Bayern of Munich midweek because I was there. Um, and the sort of atmosphere that was lived there was by a mile the best that Barcelona has been in uh, since they moved to Montjuic. Uh, record attendance in the stadium, over 5,000 people in there. Um, and yeah, and the highlight was um, just hearing the final whistle and seeing all the academy kids from Barcelona, Marcas Adol, La, La, La Minia, Malan Sufati, running to the fans and just celebrating and chanting with them. Um, noticing that the fans were just so desperate just to feel that emotion again in, in the Champions League to beat their bestia negra in a big game. Um, and the fact that something special was 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 building up, some good co some good connection was was building up ahead of the Clásico that we were about to see, um, and where Barcelona made just another um, a statement win. Well, we can say we don't know if that actually is, but well, we can just roll with it. Magnificent stuff there from Paul Belus and the yeah, parrot and the parrot and the parrot. We'll be hearing more from Paul for a very short. From the parrot, I thought you were going to say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, next up, we're going to be off to Portugal for some Portuguese and uh, oh, Premier League news. Mm. All right, Man United have found the manager to restore their club, and this time it's definitely the one. Ruben Amorim reported to be already in agreement with the Old Trafford club. To talk about that and what it means both for Manchester United and Sporting, we're joined by the executive editor for Record, David Novo. David, first of all, thank you for joining us. Based on what Ruben Amarim has achieved at Sporting, what what do you think Man United supporters can expect if this goes through? Well, uh, thanks for having me. First of all, uh, Ruben Amarim is the one of the best Portuguese coaches of this generation, without a doubt. Uh, his work for, for Sporting is impressive. Uh, two championship in uh, four years, uh, leading the championship for a third championship. Who knows if he, if he stays, of course. Um, and the way he puts Sporting playing um, Champions League football, uh, playing against the best teams, winning uh, against uh, Tottenham, for example, and, and other teams. Um, of course, he, he's the... Uh, the one of the best coaches and of course uh, for several mon months maybe in the last two years the question was when is he going to leave for a premier league club or a big big club but he always he, he always seemed like a challenge to be at sporting to he wanted to put sporting uh, at the top level uh, since it was a club that went several years without winning and he was the man that put Sporting winning uh, constantly. Um, and of course, uh, here in Portugal, when, when we have this kind of, of news, of course, there's always the question, is he ready for uh, a Premier League club? But I think it's the, the question that uh, happens with Ruben or other coaches. Happened with Jose Mourinho uh, 20 years ago, but he... he he just have won the Champions League and then went to Chelsea. Of course, I think that, of course, maybe United supporters are a little bit like, uh, OK, he won in Portugal, but can he can, can he do it in, in the Premier League? It's a deep, it's a huge cap. It's it's another level, of course, the Premier League. Uh, but I think he, he has to try. He has to see if he's uh, uh, able to to do it i think so i think he's ready for for a top top club 
I know that United, of course, uh, still is a huge club, but we know that uh, the past years have been um, difficult for for the managers. A lot of managers, I think. Well, you may know you know that better than me, but of course, since Alex Ferguson left, uh, things uh, are really, really difficult for for United. But um, young coach, a lot of quality. And I think that is up to the job. But uh, one thing is to manage sporting in Portugal, of course. Another thing is to manage United at the Premier League and, of course, Europe. Well, United, like sporting, were when he took them over, a big club that had been away from the title for a very, very long time, which yeah. I guess would all go well. What about for sporting now? What's the reaction been there? Brilliant start to the season, as you mentioned. Played nine games, won nine games in the league, scored 30 goals, conceded two. Take the manager out of there and what happens? Well, that, that's I think it's the biggest fear from, from sporting fans and I think also the, the board. Um, in two weeks, uh, sporting uh, saw Hugo Viana committed to, to Man City, of course, just for the, uh, the, the next season. But we all know that he's already working with Manchester City and sporting at the same time. Uh, of course, uh, trying to, to to manage all the transfer strategies for for the next season. And two weeks later, uh, the news that uh, Ruben is is close to Man United. Uh, uh, Hugo Viana and Ruben Amorim uh, together, and they really work really good together. Um, they are like the soul of this sporting. Um, they are. Uh, I think that the main uh, responsibles to of, of what Sporting achieved in the last years, of course, with the, the approval of the of the president, but um, Vian and Ruben Amri are they are really close friends and they work really really well together, uh, and they are the 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 responsibles for uh, for this success in my opinion. And two weeks ago, uh, Sporting uh, officially announced that Hugo Viana was leaving uh, to Manchester City. And now with this, uh, with this news about Ruben Amorim, of course, Sporting is worried. Uh, I think they have to be. Um, we are talking about all the structure, all the Sporting project that can be uh, in danger. If, for, for example, Ruben leaves tomorrow or this week, uh, we are uh, at the middle of the season, like you said, Sporting is top of the table, uh, no defeats, of course, they have uh, a really, really important goal this season uh, to win two championships in a row that it doesn't happen, uh, I think, that since uh, 70 years, it's a long, long time. And Ruben Amri always kept saying that he had the goal to win two championships in a row, that was like the, the obsession uh, if I may say, of, of sporting this season. And to see this, uh, this news, uh, we are in October or almost November with Champions League uh, matches coming by with Manchester City in, in the next weeks. Uh, with the, 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 it's, it's the middle of the season. And, and just to, 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 to imagine that the coach can leave like tomorrow or in two or three days or... Uh, well, it's 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 a reason to be a little bit worried, no, no doubt about that. David, you know when Hugo Viana went to City, did you think, like some of us maybe, that this was also to prepare Ruben Amorim going there to replace Pep Guardiola, maybe if he didn't extend his contract next season and that Viana and Amorim could be reunited as City? Yeah, that was the, the, the news since since they won. Uh, when when we knew, when we know that, that and of course, the rumors first and then the, the announcement of, of Vienna going to City, the first thing that was asked to Ruben Amrini at the press conference, of course, are, we go, are you going with him? Um, especially because at that time, and I think also now, if I'm not wrong, there are still uh, doubts about Pep Guardiola if he's going to stay or not. I think yeah. he has a contract until the 2025. So, um, of course, that was the first uh, question, and everybody thought that well, uh, the th two things can happen: or Ruben is going with the Ugu to Manchester City, or even if he's not going to Manchester City, he's going to leave Sporting at the end of the season. Also, because of that, that strong connection that he has with with Ugu Vienna. Uh, and now we have we have this. Uh, there are some reports here in Portugal, some informations that uh, 
even the, the uh, Hugo Vienna himself uh, helped a little bit on this uh, transfer. Like, for example, I don't know if it's like the, the words, but the, 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 the info here in Portugal is that uh, if uh, Ruben doesn't go to United now, he might go to City one day, even if it's not the next season or the other season. Of course, I think that Hugo Vienna, when he accepts the, the City job, is not just thinking about the first season, like a long-term job. So, uh, of course, here in Portugal, we have the feeling that uh, one day Ruben might leave to City. And now we have United at the same time, so uh, a tough week for, for sporting fans. But at the same time, it's, it's a sign of, of course, quality, competence. Uh, it, it shows that, of course, the Portuguese coaches, the Portuguese uh, sporting directors, have the quality and uh, are able to, to perform at, um, at the top level and the best championships. Magnificent. David, thank you so much for being with us uh, and uh, good luck with everything following this story and we'll hope to speak to you soon. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you. thank you very much. Lovely question, Jules, as well. Thanks, David. Amor in. Amor in. Yeah, nice. nice, James. Nice. Yeah, 10 million. Uh, <laughs> 10 million euros that's what it cost you yeah you know yeah for, for a club which has you know been making redundancies to cut costs right. you know you sack a manager you backed in the summer after mm. talking to other Extended managers this contract you mm. know you talk about you know process uh, their process is so leaky um, you know it seems to always get out thanks to some great journalism by athletic colleagues like Ornstein and Crafton but like um, you know I mean if you you put this backroom staff around what Ten Hag to support him, and you give him what uh, nine games in the I league? Know, but that, they, it was terrible, James. There's no, I get point it. I get it. How long are you going to keep but, him but, for what? But, but it's it's it, the writing was on the wall, and they got yeah. swayed by the result of, of winning, you know, the FA Cup. Um, and yeah, I think yeah, it seems like their process is to just um, you know appoint someone who uh, is the beneficiary of a kind of culture that they are still trying to. Uh, impose at, at Manchester United um, and you know you can say these guys have only been in the job uh, at executive level for you know, a few months at Man United but you know frankly anyone who talks about process is just such a blagger um, I think why well, is he <laughs> angry a bit that's a bit of a rant from well, Horny it's the second one he's had so yeah. far no, but I can understand it look uh, Ten Hag cancelled the Tottenham game so but I don't understand what this <laughs> is about <laughs> So but, what like, about, but what about you start the process with him? Yeah. What's wrong with that? Starting so the like process with him? I mean, Amarim, there are lots of things that are exciting about him. His team plays exciting football. He's also shown great adaptability yeah. in terms That's... of changing the way his team plays. No, to, really? To, I don't think so. Do you not think that they play, for example, differently with Gokeres than they did before? No. You don't think they do? I just think he's very, very dogmatic. The only thing oh. I would say, as exciting as it is, and I, I, I would be very excited to see him in the Premier League, mm is his style, which is a very risky style, even in Portugal, but because he's Portugal and his team is by far, even in terms of depth, talent, quality, right. everything. Yeah, they've only conceded two goals all season. Yeah, in nine games, which yeah. is crazy. Yeah. So, how, But, but it, I, I just don't yeah. know if you transpose that to England, yeah. if, if playing the same way, I think it's too risky. And remember, they, they played City in the Champions League two years ago, maybe? Mm. And they got back to 5-0. And he, they were playing exactly like they, they do in the league. Right. And City just to literally destroyed them. <laughs> but, but that's what I mean. When you come, for example, he wants to commit so many players forward. So the yeah. back three stays and only Hulman, who is his, like his Rodri, if you want, yeah. stays. And that's it. Everybody else is attacking all the time. And I think... I. I I wonder if you do that in the Premier League, if you will get destroyed because it's, and that's the only question mark I have is this mm. a really, really risky style, risky style that I'm not sure transposed that well to the Premier League. But, but Jules said, look, why not start the process with him now? Mm. It's start in the summer. Like, yeah. I mean, and, 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 True. and the, the, the True. that you give the manager preseason, go on tour, you know, you can align your process led recruitment with him. And what was their process-led recruitment in the summer? It was to allow Eric Ten Hag to do more Eric Ten Hag, which is to sign Matthijs de Ligt, sign Masrari. You now have half an Ajax team from four years ago, mm. which you're giving to a sporting Lisbon coach. Like, uh, and, and, and the guy is coming into a, a, a club that, you know, for all the changes that they claim to be making behind the scenes, 
is still performing as badly yeah. as prior to Ratcliffe coming in. And the roof One, as well. And the, and roof, the roof, roof as well. Roof as well. And like, least, uh, uh, we always give these people the benefit of the doubt. Who? Yeah, Jim Ratcliffe oh, yes. and that sort of thing. Without really kind of interrogating, like, what have they done in sport that has been so impressive to mm. make us believe that things are going to change at Man United? Like, Nice, like, no, but I mean, the people that he's seriously? employed, it's not him, but Berada has a good CV, sure. you know, in football. Yeah. Dan Ashworth, the same, but like Jean Claude Blanc, the same. You and I know no, him really well, sure, sure. But like, like you know, their, their process seems to be like, oh, let's just be more like City, let's get Berada, let's get Wilcox, let's get the coach that maybe will be going to Man City now that Hugo yeah, Viana is true. the is the sporting director at Man City. It's just like. It, it, I mean, a borrowed philosophy, Phil. I, I think, in, in some respects, yeah. If I'm Amarim now, and like as David says, he set out this goal to win the title back to back with mm. Porto for the first, uh, sorry, with Sporting for the first time in 70 years. Do that, stick to that, and wait for Pep to decide whatever Pep's going to do, and let Hugo Viano appoint you when Pep is gone. There you go. And like, I know a do lot of coaches have waited for Pep to leave. Maurizio Sarri, when Sarri seemed to be Pep's like chosen one. Deserbi when Pep seems uh, he seemed to be Pep's chosen one, and and Pep's ultimately always hung around mm. for longer than any any time at any other club in his in his career. But just just hang around. The, the, the number of times you see coaches think, "Oh, these opportunities don't come around again," like Graham Potter, for example, at Chelsea, mm. and everyone's looking at Chelsea. And you're like, "Look at the absolute dumpster fire that is Chelsea. Why would I take that job?" I think the same still applies to Man United. They haven't figured it out yet in terms of like That's their executive point. team. At least Ugarte will be happy because there the guy go. who made him really is going to work with him again. And and to be fair to Amorim, just to finish, mm. he does improve individually. But again, in the Portuguese league, right. he improves his players individually. Ugarte is a prime example. Your Keres is another one. Of course, there are many others. Mm. So on that level, I would be very happy if I was a Manchester United play, player to work with somebody like that. Next up, I want to hear about the huge events this weekend in Spain, the Clasico and more. For that, over to Paul Belus next. Saturday night at the Bernabeu. Barcelona winning 4-0 in the Clasico away in Madrid. Paul Belus. That must be their biggest win in a very long time in the Spanish capital. And I would say that the biggest week that Barcelona has had in a long time. Um, mm. It felt like, yeah, it felt like Therapy for for just for Barcelona fans just to go there and win in the way that they won, uh, not just for the goals, but the fact of having those young kids from La Masia just to stepping up and playing at the Bernabeu um, and giving these feelings that Barcelona have in their hands. You now the big generation. I'm not saying that Casado is going to be Xavi or that Fermin is going to be Iniesta, but they are a special generation, special group of players. They have this feeling of belonging to the fans, to the club, um, which makes people proud. The buzz around Barcelona and how it felt around the city was remarkable, something that has not been seen for a while here. Um, and I include in that package as well, of course, the Bayern win. Um, and yeah, yeah, uh, exciting times for Barcelona. Um, I think that they they were looking for some sort of a statement this week and they did two of them. Eight goals against Bayern and Real Madrid are amazing, but nothing, felt, nothing feels the same as... Uh, as it does winning at the Bernabeu and yeah, just making Real Madrid feel powerless against a team that is surprisingly so well structured with with Hansi Flick. Absolutely, you talk about the kids, but the German imports Lewandowski with his extraordinary run, seventeen goals in fourteen games between La Liga and the Champions League at, at the age of what is it, thirty seven? Six, I think. Thirty six. Yeah, right. thirty six. And the manager Hansi Flick. Uh, with the way that he approached the game, much like with the Bayern match, this high line, which looked like it might be their weakness, turns out again to be their strength. Absolutely, absolutely. And Flick wanted to be a bit cryptic about the high line. Uh, he was asked a lot if he was about to take a step back uh, ahead of those two games. And he was a bit cryptic. He wasn't saying much. But after the Bernabeu, after the game, a lot of players like basically confessed the secret. I think that it, it was Iñaki Peña and Marquez Adó who went out to the mix and, and said... In precision, uh, three weeks after training started, Flick told us, look, we're going to play with this high line and this is not going to change. Whoever the opponent is, this, this is not going to change. That's that's my idea and I want this team to play like that. And that's what they did. Um, 
Mbappe was in offside eight times. Kylian Mbappe was caught in offside eight times. Um, ahead of this game, Barcelona were, uh, I think, that averaging 6.5 offsides per game. Um, and that was like uh, La Liga all-time record. Uh, no no other side in La Liga has registered these sort of figures. Um, so yeah, the approach of Hansi Flick um, has a lot to do with that. He's been able to create a culture, a good atmosphere in the dressing room. He's allowed some leaderships to grow in personalities that are important in this team. I'm talking about Rafinha here and Inigo Martinez. Lewandowski has added that to that group as well as, as sort of veterans who listen to the young players who are basically the core of this football team. All the Pedris, the Gabis, the Laminia Mal, Casado, Kubarsi, Alejandro Valde. All those players are the core and the future of Barcelona. Now they have a group of veterans who really listen to them, are quite understanding with them. Um, yeah, um, and the approach that Flick has had in terms of he's an outsider of the Entorno. We have discussed that a lot of times here in, in this podcast and, and that helps him. Um, and yeah, you mentioned Lewandowski as well. I think that we praise a lot and deservedly the power of La Masia and the impact that he's had. But if you don't have a striker like Lewandowski, you don't win that game. Mm -hmm. um, the way in that he scored the first two goals, the way he took the chances, the header for the second goal, you need a really good striker to score them. Um, he's really good playing with the centre-backs, like holding the pressure. He's improved in the link-up play. So yeah, all, all good news for, for Barcelona and for all the people involved in that project. Indeed so. Less so for Real Madrid, who find themselves six points behind the Catalans. What's the reaction been like in the Spanish capital? Where is the finger of blame appointing for this defeat? There, there, there's been a lot of fingers pointing to a lot of people after this defeat. Uh, like the Spanish press are quite... Um, yeah, they like a traumatic reaction after those sort of big games, so they are quite, yeah, bold. Um, I think that to an extent, uh, Real Madrid had been able to cover with good results a uh, start of the season that hadn't been good. Uh, the feelings in games hadn't been good. There had been a lot of warning signs around, but having this firepower that they have, it basically, yeah, as I was saying, it covered a lot of problems. But now, I think that a lot of fingers have been pointing to Kylian Mbappe for what I was saying, the lack of offsides um, that he was caught uh, on, basically, because that was something that you know about Barcelona. Barcelona was about to play with this high line, so you had to prepare to face against this. And Mbappe seems like the perfect player to play against this, but he didn't manage to find the timing in runs and everything. Um, and then a lot of scrutiny as well in the in the goalkeeper, while well, Courtois wasn't there, Lunin, some part of the Madrid media thing that could have done better. Ferland Mendy wasn't great. Lucas Vázquez wasn't great. And I think that Real Madrid overall, it's basically like a team effort. Uh, I think that the virtue of Barcelona is that the team is the, the system is so well connected, it clicks so well, and that's what doesn't happen at Real Madrid. They don't click, they still are trying to figure things out, and that's the main problem that they have ahead of them. Mm. Maybe missing a figure like Tony Cruz. Speaking of midfielders, possibly <laughs> we should flag up the we should flag up the the sea change almost in this game that happened at halftime when when Hansi Flick decided to bring on uh, Frankie de Jong. Exactly. That was a winning change, in my opinion, because the first half was quite tight. Uh, in fact, Real Madrid could have scored if they would have, if they would have been more 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 clinical. But I think that Flick was really clever. Uh, it was a manager move. Uh, this Barcelona has been praised for being more direct, more more straightforward when they attack. But he went the other way at halftime. He took Fermin off, who is a rock and roll player, box to box, and put Frankie de Jong in in order to offer more pausa, just to calm the game down. Um, add another holding midfielder, put Pedri a bit more forward and give this extra pass in midfield that uh, in the end of the day, it gave Barcelona like a better timing when they wanted to attack. It prevented them from conceding more counterattacks. And in my opinion, that was, yeah, as I was saying, just a winning move uh, from a Flick, a manager who is brave enough to make changes, is brave enough to accept that things are not going well and just to act on it. And that's something that has been pointed as well to Carlo Ancelotti, um, who is another one that is taking a lot of blame. Um, there's, yeah, a lot of responsibility has been thrown to the manager, as it tends to happen in in Madrid, I would say. When things are not working, you look to the manager because you have great players, so why the manager doesn't make it work? Um, and yeah, Carlo Ancelotti is, yeah, uh, is going through a big scrutiny now. Um, yeah, I mean, there's also... There's all, 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 always been the saying that if you end up a season trophy in Real Madrid, there's no way that a manager can survive. Mm. I think that that would be the case with Ancelotti. Mm, no matter that he won the Champions League in La Liga last season, Real Madrid has just no memory. Um, but, but yeah, that's a bit how the story was at the, at the Clásico. 
Amazing. Bad weekend for Madrid sides in general because Atletico Madrid, who a few days before had been defeated by Lille in the Champions League, were now uh, beaten 1-0 by Real Betis. So Real Betis are now only two points behind them up in fifth place in La Liga. Uh, how good are Real Betis and how bad right now are uh, Atleti? It's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. I think that... I don't want to be like too cruel on Atletico Madrid, but I think that there's more to blame on them. Um, when we did the season preview, I think Atletico has the goods to be competing with Barcelona and Real Madrid has the players to be up there, but they, yeah, they just don't manage to find a way on inside the pitch. They don't tick. Um, and, and Real Madrid is a good side. When you go to their stadium, it's one of the toughest places to go in La Liga. Um, the atmosphere is amazing. One of the best, if you want to go to a La Liga game and you go to Sevilla, go to any Sevilla stadium. Both the stadiums are amazing. And Sevilla are going through a good moment. They have good young players. Um, they, they have Pablo Fornal, who had a good game. Vito Roque from Barcelona. Johnny Cardoso, a guy who Tottenham have some rides on after the Lo Celso trade to, back to Real Betis. It was outstanding, in my opinion. Um, and yeah, Atletico Madrid, what a nightmare. They weren't able to create... Uh, too many problems to 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 Real Betis. I think that Julian Alvarez has improved a bit, but it's overall it's like the midfield doesn't manage to connect. I think that the defense they haven't had like enough changes in there. There's still like the old structure, um, and Atletico Madrid are, are struggling quite a lot. And I wouldn't be surprised to to see other teams such as Villarreal or teams like that being close to Atletico de Madrid if they continue like this. Well, they're currently in fourth place, but ten points off the top of the table in the newfangled Champions League. They're down in 27th. 27th, Paul. Uh, one thing we should flag up, who are busy climbing their way up La Liga, a Las Palmas, who are now, I think, one point from safety. And this is all after a, a change on the bench uh, for the Islanders. Yeah, yeah. Two games after... Uh, two wins, sorry, after two games since Diego Martinez took over. Um, I'm sorry because Oli McBurney hasn't mm -hmm. started either of those games. Um, but yeah, no, Las Palmas has been, yeah, um, I think that they've been more pragmatic than than effective to some regard, because against Valencia, it was a quite tight game, a really dramatic game because of what they had at, at the stake, but they won. And against Girona, it was not an outstanding game, but yeah, they managed to win. Um, they have Alberto Moleiro, uh, if you haven't followed him, uh, you should, because he's a young, real talent. He's really informed this season. He's a joy to watch, one of those attacking midfielders, so... Full of flair, playing yeah, for, off of the left wing. He's in a really good moment. Um, I think that the uh, loan signing that they made in Dario Esugo from Sporting de Portugal has had a huge impact as well. Um, and yeah, Las Palmas are building up to some to some better form because they haven't managed to win a single game under the former ma former manager Luis Carrion and now with Diego Martinez, two out of two. Excellent. You know who their next game is against, Paul? You have killed me now. Atletico Madrid, they're going to oh, be... Wow. Uh, the Chivas is Metropolitano. Well, yeah. Wouldn't it be amazing if they got a win there too? I guess we'll have to wait and see uh, oh. till next Sunday. Uh, magnificent, Paul. We'll be hearing from you in a week's time. We will, yeah, yeah, yeah. Other storylines. Have a great time in the meanwhile. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you so much. Paul Belus. Next up, big weekend in Italy. James Horncastle's ready to go. <laughs> that... Oh, just the highest scoring Derby d'Italia since 1932. Is it true? Wow. Yep. Was uh, that the 9-1? 6-2 uh, for 6 6-2. Okay. Wow. Anyway, it was the big game in Italy this weekend. It was Inter against Juventus. It finished 4-4. But James, I mean, we touched on some of the moments earlier on and the pivotal role that the introduction of Kenan Yildiz had on the game. What a performance. 4-2 down when he comes on. And they, they, they should have, as you were mentioning, been further in the lead than that but young Turk turned it around yeah and he came into the game I think with quite a lot of uh, pressure um, because he hadn't scored or assisted in six games um, and already you had these kind of you know old school Italian dinosaur pundits um, saying uh, you know he's leggerino you know he's this kind of lightweight giocoliere you know which is like a juggler you know and all this sort of stuff you know I would one guy editor of Corriere della Sport was basically on TV saying um, rather than watch this guy I think we should bring Totti out of retirement uh, Totti's That's 48 Totti's That's considering really coming out of retirement and, 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 and straight that, afterwards yeah. Totti's like oh well I've got one or two clubs <laughs> interested in me funny you should say that um, and you know the kid he's 19 Yildiz he's going to have ups and downs he's not going to be able to like 
deliver every week. But in what was a huge game, the biggest game of the season for Juventus, he comes on the bench and clinically delivers big moments at San Siro, which which matters. Like Del Piero, you know, the guy whose number 10 shirt he has and the guy whose celebration he imitated after scoring uh, the equaliser, he was like, this is actually massive. To do it on this stage, under the pressure of this game, you come on, your team's 4-2 down. Not only that, as you were saying, James, they should be 5-6-2 down, and you pull them back. Um, you know, magnificent. You know, that that's those are the type of moments where you really judge players and really judge talent because it's really kind of clutch, clinch, under-pressure moments, mm. and he did it. Nice. Aside from the fact that it was a brilliant game to watch, what does it what does it tell us? Where does it leave us in this year's title race? So I think, as far as Inter are concerned, they have peaks of performance, which I don't think any other team in Italy has, um, because they can overwhelm you um, and should be two, three goals in front. But they're not as clinical as they were um, last year. I think Lautaro is is maybe suffering some fatigue from. Having a, a long season last year, when you know they won the 20th league title, which was a very big deal for Inter, won their second star. He was top scorer in the league. Goes to the Copa America with all the pressure of, oh, you got dropped in the World Cup, didn't you? Julian Alvarez took your place. He had something to prove for Argentina. He proved it. They won the Copa America. He was top scorer in that. And then he comes back. I think he's a bit jaded. Um, and you've got Turam, who's having to carry the team yeah. offensively. They were without Chalanolu as well. Uh, and without the ball, they're just not as defensively sound as they were last year. They keep leaking goals. So Inter, Missing a, a Cherubi as well. Missing a Cherubi. Yeah. Inter kind of very leaky in a way that they just weren't last year. I think Juventus showed, um, as Jules was saying, they were always in the game. And this is a kind of character trait we're already seeing from that Leipzig game, for example, where they go down to 10 men. Um, they go 2-1 down, um, they give a penalty away, and they still somehow find a way not only to draw that game, but to come back and yeah. win it. To come back and draw this game against the champions, the team that you want to kind of knock off their perch, I think was big for Juventus. However, um, you could see that this is an extremely young team, which is having ups and downs. Yeah, the, the attack that they ended the game with, Yildiz 19 Mbangula 21, Concisau 20. Yeah, like, I mean, Juventus is very much uh, youth, you know, by right. name and nature. Yeah. Mm. And I think that they miss Bremer, their centre half, the best centre half mm. in the league. And that's why they've started to concede goals. They could have conceded three against Stuttgart, they mm. did concede four against Inter. Um, and the big winner of it all was Napoli coach Antonio Conte, right. former Inter and Juventus coach. He's now four points clear at the top of the Serie A standings with his uh, Napoli side. They beat Lecce 1-0 this weekend. Inter, four points behind them. Juve, a point further back. And then you've got four teams who are a point behind Juventus. Uh, interesting quartet yeah. as well. Fiorentina, Atalanta, who had a 6-1 victory. Mm. Who they beat 6-1? Hellas Verona. Hellas Verona. Atalanta, who had a 6-1 victory against Hellas Verona. Lazio, who beat Genoa. A 3-0. Udinese. You've got an interesting quartet behind them. Fiorentina, Atalanta, Lazio and Udinese. Uh, Jules, I was just going to mention Fiorentina, but was there something else you were going to... No, say? no, no. Just just I was uh, looking. Napoli play Milan in midweek. Tonight. This week. Yeah. Atalanta Tonight. the weekend and then Inter the next game. So the next three games are just, in a way, not season-defining because it's too early, but we maybe know more a bit about Napoli and Conte. Yeah. And also where the table stands after that. That's a very good point. Very good point. Because there is midweek action and Tuesday night brings uh, Milan, Napoli at San Siro. Milan, whose game at the weekend was postponed because of the flooding in Bologna. Yeah, and they were very angry about this. Um, you know, there was flooding in Bologna. Um, people did die. You know, houses collapsed and that sort of thing. But by the time the game was due to be played, or mm. the day the game was due to be played, it seemed to be bright sunshine pitch looked fantastic at the Renata Dallada. Milan felt they'd done everything possible to try and get the game played on neutral ground as well. We could play in Como, for example. Bologna were like, no, we want to play the game so that we can donate the great, uh, the gate receipts to a, a charity that is dealing with the floods or sort of thing. But it meant that Milan, um, they were supposed to be without two of their suspended players for the game against Bologna. 
Tijani Reinders and Teo Hernandez they will now have to serve the suspension against Napoli Ooh. which, yeah, which again, is not a great look no, no. no. Um, so mm. I think Jules was talking about this really tough run of fixtures that Conte and Napoli have got coming up but they are kind of helped by what has happened with Milan mm. in terms of yeah, they'll be without two of their best players they're not in Europe so they can just game plan from from week to week, and uh, you know I think the, the the issue that Juventus and Inter have is like if you give a Conte team an inch, he will take a mile, mm. and um, and so but let's see how they come through this. That quartet of teams you mentioned, yep. I think, is really interesting because uh, Fiorentina scored fifteen goals in a week. Um, you know, I think it's their best start to the season attacking wise. Um, since Luca Toni was up front when they, when he then went to the World Cup and won the World Cup. Um, and the, the one frustration that Fiorentina fans had, well, one frustration, with Vincenzo Italiano, even though he kept getting them into cup finals, was the team would create loads of chances and not score any. Um, and now they're scoring five, six, five. You know, it's, yeah, it's pre- pretty fun. Well, uh, five this weekend in a 5-1 victory over Roma. Moise Kane getting a brace. Eduardo Bove against uh, his parent club also on the score sheet. And a result so disastrous for the Giallorossi that the early talk this week was that they were going to fire the manager that they brought in to replace the fired Daniele De Rossi <laughs> and replace him with De, De Rossi. That hasn't happened. But apparently it's now all on Thursday night's clash with Torino. What a mess. Yeah, Juric, the coach, his, his old club. Um, I mean, that uh, Fiorentina game was uh, one of the worst I've ever experienced as a, uh, as a Romanista. I mean, because you, you had a, a situation where um, they, uh, they made two substitutions after half an hour. Um, you know, they brought off Cristante and Angelino. Uh, which was a real kind of statement by Urich to say, you've had an awful game. <laughs> uh, and then he, he, he brings on this guy, Manu Kone, who they signed in the summer late. Uh, he gets them back into the game, 2-1. He thought, okay, they've sorted this out now. It's all going to be fine. And then 90 seconds after they got that goal back, Fiorentina scored again. Half time, he takes off another senior player, Mancini, and then the senior players, Mancini Cristante, don't come out and sit on the bench for the second half. Um, and it gets worse. Hermoso, one of their free transfers, gets sent off. They bring on Mats Hummels. Mats Hummels. Five well, minutes later. For his debut as well. For his debut. <laughs> Hummels scores an own goal. Amazing. Um, and it, it felt like one of those games where, even though Juric is uh, still in charge for the Torino game, there's no coming back. Really? Well, I, I mean, Alia yak to I mean, rest. As, as much as this, I think the interesting thing is, and this is the problem that Roma have got themselves into, one of a number of problems that the Friedkin family have got themselves into, is um, Juric has the same agent, I suppose, yeah. as Brian Cristante and Gianluca Mancini, the, the two senior players who have essentially mutinied here. And, you know, I think if you're. If you're the Freakins, although they they probably won't be doing this, they'd be giving it to a, the job to a chief executive. They don't have a chief executive um, to basically get the agent in the room and say, "Coach, senior players, sort this out." Sort this out. Um, but I don't. I don't think it's going to happen. I just thought it was very interesting that. Uh, I mean, the agent must be tearing his hair out here. Just like you know, I put my coach in here with players who mm. I represent, and they seem to be at loggerheads. Who'd be an agent, eh? Who? <laughs> Good to see Fiorentina doing so well, though. As you say, it's been oh, a frustrating great. time under Italiano, but uh, yeah, brilliant I, performance. Yeah, and I, I thought Palladino, one of the young up-and-coming managers, um, you know, he, he got the job at Monza as a caretaker, really, and did so well um, that he got it on a full-time basis. And he's kind of seen as this Gasparini chip off the old block. He used to play under him. They, his Monza teams played 3-4-2-1 like Atalanta do. But like Monza were a newly promoted club that were really, that, you know, a really, it was mutton dressed as lamb. They're not a newly promoted club. They were a club backed by Berlusconi and Galliani and spent loads of money, <laughs> had a big wage bill. And it was kind of quite hard to judge a young up and coming manager on that basis. He gets the Fiorentina job. They started not very well. They weren't winning games, but they weren't losing games. And then he's changed system. So they play with a back four. Changed how they man. They changed how they mark. So no longer zonal marking, go man marking. 
they've got six young Italian players in the team, um, which I think Spalletti is really keen for. And he's getting goals out of Moise Ken. Um, you know, Moise Ken, who could have had a hat trick against Roma. Uh, Ritegi, what has scored uh, 10 goals as well for Atalanta. Yeah, top scorer. Yeah, so amazing. all of a sudden, Italy has strikers who are scoring, just as Mario Balotelli. Just as Mario oh, Balotelli is Mario. coming back. Ritegi, who left Genoa for Atalanta, was uh, heavily involved in their 6 1 victory over Hellas. Verona at the weekend, Atalanta. But Genoa, who are uh, down the other end of the table in the relegation zone, beaten 3 0 by Lazio this weekend. They've only scored seven in nine matches so far. Is Balotelli the answer, James? Well, I mean, he's been without a club for a, for a long time. Um, since May. Since May, when he left Adana Demispor. Uh, to be honest, like, in fairness to Mario, he looks like he's serious about this. Hmm. And he's given a few interviews where he said, you know, a lot of things you read and hear about me are wrong. Right. You know, I've never been someone who's essentially um, divided the dressing room uh, and all these sort of things. And he then kind of, he, he promised that if he were to come back to Syria, he would, uh, quote, smash it. Smash it. And um, so let's see if he does. I mean, I'm, I'm all for it. You know. Ah, it's great that he's back. They are going to be facing oh Fiorentina on Thursday. Yeah. Sure might be, be might not be much fit yet, right? No, I mean uh, no. I mean he's just been doing a lot of gym work. I think yeah. yeah I mean Genoa is so desperate they probably will throw him in. Put him in. Um, and um, and yes, Spalletti was on TV, uh, the Italy coach, um, and now he's he's spoiled for choice um, with. Uh, Ritegi, Moise Ken, even Lorenzo Luca, Udinese, mm. who are joint four, well. is scoring goals. And I think um, Spalletti was asked about Balotelli. He was like, my door is always open. My door is always open. Van door? Even for Totti. Well, maybe not. Maybe Even though not. they've Surely made not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brilliant. Well, what a great City Out roundup that was, James. Lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is there anything else you want to add? Because there's Ligue 1 standing by. Yeah, let's go to Ligue 1. Yes. Uh, let's up hit next that. with Julien Laurent. Jules. Great weekend in France. Those Amazing. big games, Le Classique, the Debbie de Nord. The four Debbie. derbies we had, yeah. In four. Yeah, what was the other one? So you had uh, Classique. Yeah. That's, uh, let me see, PSG Olympic Marseille. That's right. Then you had the Debbie de Nord, which was Lille mm. against Lens. Yeah, that's right. Then you had the Derby de Côte d'Azur. The Mediterranean the derby, Mid yeah. Okay, which yeah. Is, was Nice against Monaco. Yeah. Monaco's first defeat of the season. Yeah, that's right. And then the Occitanie derby between Montpellier and Toulouse. On the other What's, side, what do you call that one? The Occita like Occitan. Occitan. Yeah. All right, okay. Which Oxy finished three? Yeah, the Oxytan <laughs> derby. Is it sponsored? <laughs> <laughs> it could be, to be fair. Yeah. Um, it was great. It was a great weekend. Yeah. Some of those games lived up to expectations, I right. think. Like the classic, the, not so much, I'm guessing you're going to say. No. I mean, I think we, that's where we have to start because it was over after 20 minutes. Some say it was even over after seven. Really? When PSG scored the first goal right. because it was pretty obvious that the plan De Zerbi had in place was just never going to work that Luis Enrique had won already the tactical battle. It was pretty obvious that some of the key players for Marseille, especially Mason Greenwood, was just not in that game at all. Mm. And he was actually the the core of all the criticism and the unhappiness of his own teammates, Hoiberg and Rabio, who shouted at him towards the end of the first half because he was just not doing anything, not running, There's not a playing. bit where he, he, he loses it. His pass gets intercepted by Yeah, PSG for the third goal. Yeah. For the third goal. And it's remarkable how he just basically watches... Yeah. Just Completely. watches them go, go and just score. walks around. Yeah, yeah, so Rabiot not happy at all. De Zerbi singling him out publicly and privately, which is really strange saying, I just didn't like his game. I didn't like how he played. And he's their best player. So if he's not on a good day, even for just 20 minutes, right. it's not going to happen. How, how did Rabiot get on? He was not bad, to be fair. Obviously, all the eyes were on him. Mm. Uh, he had a decent opportunity at some point at 10 men. But the red card for Amin Arit, which was one of three Paris born and bred Marseille players in that right. game, of course, with Rabio and Eli Wahi, mm. which is a, it's a very harsh red card. I should mm. not have been a red card. I think the referee got it wrong. Changed the whole game after that. There was just no game. But for the first time ever, PSG were 3 0 up at halftime. And now it's, they haven't lost in Marseille since 2011 in the league and haven't conceded a goal since 2017 in Marseille wow. in the league either. So cool. That's Marseille's fourth red card in the last six. Liga matches, yeah. although presumably De Zerbi will be denying it because 
Uh, it was such a harsh decision. Yeah, to be fair to him, he he said like it's not a red card, and uh, I, but I think everybody agreed it's not it's, it's not even a debate. Uh, the referee came on French television to explain mm-hmm. his decision and saying he With was his a reckless. On, on a no, <laughs> no parrot, <laughs> no parrot this time okay. singing uh, the PSG anthem. But but he said it's a uh, reckless the the high foot which is not that high but yeah. it's still on the sternum is that what you say also oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. on Marquinhos and you see the you see the blood and the uh, stud marks the stud marks exactly mm. uh, but yeah so the game was over but good win for PSG I guess oh yeah right so is it <laughs> PSG now the only unbeaten side in Liga because uh, Monaco and Wilstel's Lens yeah both lost this weekend they are three points clear the Parisians of Monaco and six now. Of Marseille. What happened to Monaco against Nice in the début de la Côte d'Azur? They got a red card themselves oh, just no. before the break, Wanderson, and that changed the whole game. And to be fair, Nice, who had not won for a long time, were, were good. They were intense. They pressed. They also played in Europe on Thursday night. Mm. Monaco played on Tuesday night. Mm. Uh, but they, they went after them once they were 11 against 10 for the whole second half. And it was disappointing for Monaco, I think, to lose that way. The red card is the two yellows. Is, I don't think there's any debate there either. But but for Adi Hutter and Monaco, it's a, it's a bit of a uh, like a, a stop in how good they mm. were doing in their progression because they usually score a lot of goals, create a lot of chances, and in that game, they were just not themselves. Uh, nice to see uh, Getien Laborde firing the cannon after the game. Yeah, Jules. yeah, yeah. That was good. Mm. Not really sure no. <laughs> where it came from, but yeah, he scored the winning goal, so I guess right. that's where it came from. How uh, often do they get the cannon out? Yeah, not much. I think so. It's co- there in the. It's a little cannon. Yeah, it's a little cannon, and you just pull the. Why do Arsenal do this? That's a very yeah, good question. I don't know I, because it's the you know it's the year of the anniversary. Oh, I think maybe. that's where it comes from. Okay. And it's the first derby since the the anniversary. Maybe mm. you would think of all the ideas that Mikel Arteta has, right? You know, sort of drawing hearts, didn't. the light bulbs, the playing yeah. you never walk. Well, why not this? Yeah. You know, maybe he yes. will. I can I can have a word. Maybe mm. you know, <laughs> Lille uh, two nil winners at oh, Lens, yeah. capping off another great week. Incredible. For, Le Lille, Le De Dukes. Yeah, mm. Pep Genesio. Uh, they got lucky on this one, though. The penalty yeah. is never a penalty. So it was nil-nil. Yeah. Going into the 98th minute? Yeah, that's 98th right. 98th minute? 98th minute. Nil-nil in the 98th minute, and yeah. it ends 2 nil. Yeah. That's Lille a got a dramatic finish. It is dramatic. Got a penalty that was really harsh. I thought we're still not happy at all at the end mm. on French television, saying, like, I went to see the referee, and he just said, yeah, sometimes those are not given. <laughs> <laughs> and we still was like, okay, but tonight you gave it in a game like this in the 98th minute. So he was just like, I don't understand. I'm not going to go to those meetings anymore because it's right. pointless. Referees say one thing and they do another thing at, on the day of the game. Did he say all this in French? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, his French is perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. What did uh, the parrot say? The parrot said nothing. <laughs> Although Will still has his two brothers in his own staff. So on the right. bench, you've got three stills. Wow. I was expecting a joke from one of you two on the three steals, but which is great. I guess keep it to the family, and yeah. they, they, they've done really well until like um, they they were very good in the first half, the better team. I think in the second half it evened up a little bit, but mm. they didn't deserve to lose to Nil for sure. Okay, Lille though, everybody loses to Lille these days. Yeah. Stunning the continent with their back-to-back victories over the Madrid sides because just a few days before this, again, a slightly fortuitous refereeing decision perhaps yeah, for that contributing again. to this. Yeah. A 3-1 win though over Atleti and, and French sides in Europe. When we touched on this last time, we'd had a Champions League round, but Jules again, Brest, yeah, holding by Leverkusen to a 1-1 draw. The yeah, only team in the Champions League not them doing it <laughs> it's PSG I PSG, guess PSG only one win so far yeah yeah one win one defeat one draw the draw against PSV was was a bad one because they had enough chances to win it but mm. we see the next game is against Atletico Madrid at the Parc de Prince which would be massive but for Lille and Pep Genesio after beating Carlo Ancelotti as you said three weeks earlier and becoming only the third manager in history to beat Mourinho, Guardiola and Ancelotti in Europe. Now he adds Diego Simeone to the list and then he's only the second manager to be Pep, Carlo, Diego and, and Jose, the other one being Jurgen Klopp. So mm. r- remarkable Pep Genesio who, with a bit of a wonky lineup to start with because he, as he said himself, I'm playing a, a B team against Atletico Madrid because I need my starters for the, the derby, which is the most important game for us. 
it's more important that That's we. That's crazy, though, isn't it? Yeah, but I guess finishing top four in mm. Liga at the end of the season is more important than trying to beat Atletico Madrid. So let they me need, get this they need Champions League Finishing next season. top four so you get into Europe is more important than actually winning games in Europe when you get there. Because they know that they're never going to win the Champions League. Right. So the only way you can qualify for the Champions League next season is by winning the Champions League if you don't do it through your league. Mm. So for them, the league will always be the priority. Mm. That, was his mind, that was his mindset and the thinking. Mm. So he put Zegrova on the bench and David on the bench and Gomez on the bench. All those big, big players... And still, still, still they, right. they, they beat Atletico Madrid. So. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, we said about how Man United have been progressively <laughs> becoming more City. Yeah. Like, surely just hire a Pep, you know, like yeah. Pep Genesio. Pep Genesio. I would love to see Better Pep than Pep Linders. Yeah. Um, uh, That's in, two in, Peps. In, in the kind of Pep That's imitators. Good. But at least Pep Genesio beats all of these guys, yeah. you know. Yeah. I Lille. mean, Pep Genesio sees himself in the Premier League one day. For Does he? One of the top clubs, yeah, so it might happen. Lille are currently up in fourth place, uh, just behind Marseille on goal difference. But six points behind Paris Saint-Germain, three behind Monaco. I mean, they're, they're kind of moving nicely into the thick yeah. of it now. Form side. Yeah, Ooh. very good. Do very you want good. to finish off with a quick mention of the Corsican derby? Because it's always a tasty affair, or are you not that bothered? Uh, no, OK. It, the game was suspended yeah, anyway. Suspended, I, yeah, suspended, I judge you against Bastia, but... Uh, excellent. Thank you very much, Jules. Next up, we're off to the Bundesliga. All righty. Woo. Seb Stafford-Blord joins us. Seb. Oh, we were just talking about the French sides in Europe. First of all, a, a terrible match day three in the Champions League for, for the five German sides. What happened there? Yeah, a really, really terrible night for Bayern Munich. I mean, it it did feel a little bit like before the international break, dark clouds were gathering over Vincent Company, and that conversation's kind of been restarted. Um, very, very difficult. On the plus side, I suppose it's the first time all season that the German media has paid attention to what Hansi Flick is doing in La Liga. A lot of admiration for what he's been able to do there because i think uh, for a lot of people it's a kind of a, a culture clash it wasn't a very obvious fit the german in barcelona kind of got a strange vibe to it flicky um, flacker flicky flacker says james horncastle <laughs> um, but very very tricky um, right. and um yeah it's also I, I think all the way through this season um people have been looking for context for what vincent company has done like you can beat Holstein Kiel, you beat Bochum as they did over the weekend, 5-0. Mm. What does it actually mean? And these are always going to be the games in which they're judged. And um, yeah, not a very flattering context, was it? No, indeed not. Bochum getting a hammering, much like your neighbour's wall in the background there mm -hmm. uh, this weekend. 5-0, Harry Kane on the score sheet, of course. Michael Elise, uh, Jamal Musiala, Leroy Sané and Kingsley Conan, the other scorers. As Bayern took their goals tally to 29 Goals after eight matches as the joint highest in Bundesliga history. The goal difference is plus 22. No other team in the Bundesliga has even scored 22 goals. Crazy. Anyway, uh, they are joint top of the table or level on points with RB Leipzig, who saw a Freiburg 3-1 on the weekend after their own Champions League disappointment. Bad news for Leipzig, though, because Xavi Simmons is out for the rest of how long? The rest of the, this calendar year? More? Yeah, they're being conservative, really, Jimbo. So they're saying they expect him back in training probably in December, but the decision for him to have surgery, so he limped off against Liverpool with uh, damage to his to his uh, ankle ligaments in his left foot. And they made a decision based on his long-term future. Let's not do something quickly so that he can just be part of our season. Let's make sure that we're serving his his career in the kind of the broader sense better. And fair enough, because he's on loan. Um, so had the procedure in Munich over the weekend done probably until the new year, which is really tricky because um, they've got a whole load of really, really important games coming up. I mean, they've got they got Villa in the Champions League, Inter in the Champions League. Uh, they go to Borussia Dortmund this weekend um, and they play Bayern Munich in their final game before the Winterpause. So without Simons, um, because he's the connecting piece, because he is arguably their most gifted player, their most flamboyant, the most technically gifted, their best creator, to my money. Really, really savage blow. And, and and also a time when you still can't really trust this side. How consistent can they be? Because yes, the top of the Bundesliga, joint top of the Bundesliga, haven't been beaten in Germany all season domestically. But yet, um, in those big games, um, you're going to need players like Simons, particularly if, you know, and it's a perennial problem for Leipzig, their young side, their recruitment demands um, that they're always looking towards the future. But as a result, when they come in those big games, do they have the set of intangibles that come with having the more experienced types, with having the talisman, 
like when you take Simons out of that side, you're losing something definitely. Mm. Well, if they can't continue to match Bayern's pace, who will? It's funny to think that companies under pressure there with his side and Leipzig, both five points uh, ahead of the uh, chasing pack already. The nearest teams being uh, Bayer Leverkusen and Union Berlin still, and uh, mm. Freiburg, who are all five points back, as I say. Uh, Leverkusen, who had a 2 2 draw away at Werder Bremen this weekend, they got Leverkusen in this one. There's a sloppiness, there's this residual sloppiness which has crept into their play, Jimbo. And this was another very, very late goal conceded by conceded to Ramona Schmidt. But Leverkusen have this at the moment. It's almost as if there's a lack of focus in their football and they keep surrendering winning positions. And they did it twice in this game. Played some nice football along the way. Really nice opening goal from Victor Boniface to put them one up. Back to 1-1. One, one. Marvin Deutsch um, equalised. A wonderful world-class own goal. Put them back ahead. If you haven't seen that, try and try and dig it out. Um, and then, yeah, that late Romano Schmidt goal. Nice, nice goal. Um, felt a little bit like it was uh, Lucas Rodetsky, the goalkeeper, returning to the kind of form which made people say a few years ago, you can never win a title with him in goal for you. Um, yeah. Which he took a break from that last week, last year, obviously. This is a little bit quaver If yeah. I don't know, that doesn't count the expression. But we'll no, try it. See if it catches on. Let's see if it catches 100%. on. 100%. Yeah. Uh, Dortmund had their third away defeat in a row in the Bundesliga when they went to Augsburg. if Vincent Kompany's receiving pelters. Uh, how are things for Nuri Shahin in charge of Dortmund? Yeah, n- nothing is good at all at Dortmund. So Nuri Shahin, I think people are, there's a lot of criticism around him, but it's always it's also tempered by this, well, he shouldn't be in the position anyway. People who, who don't really trust the project um, are kind of spreading the blame for that. And to them, I think Shaheen being there, um, the lack of the unwillingness to throw the windows open and allow in some outside um, influences, that's the thing being criticized. And especially because this Augsburg game um, f- features so many familiar Dortmund problems, defensive mistakes, lapses in concentration, slightly anemic attacking product. And Shaheen is making it hard for himself. So half time, um, for instance, he took off Valdemir Anton, replaced him with Emre Chan. Chan, who is as divisive a Dortmund player as, as exists. Um and must have been it, and must have been exhausted after all that chasing he did last midweek. <laughs> yeah, he didn't have a good time, did he? Anyway, came on, replaced Anton, was playing out of position at centre half, very quickly made the mistake which gave Augsburg their go ahead goal. And you could just see it. If you watch the goal and you see his response, you know what's coming next. And you know he knows what's coming next. And Jan has been has become one of those players who um, he's the lightning rod. He feels privately as if he's over-criticized. And he's always the kind of the, 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 the part of the team where the fingers get pointed. And um, he kind of exists between this sort of strange bravado and self-regard and confidence versus a real sensitivity to criticism, which I, I guess is kind of common for a lot of players. Um, but it's the go-to position. When something's wrong, uh, have a go at Emery Chan. He's like what David Batty used to be in previous England teams. Do you remember those days when, you know, it wasn't very good, didn't work very well? What's the problem? Ah, it's probably David Batty. Mm. Emery Chan is today's David Batty. Emery so. Chan. I wow. feel like I've aged myself with that. Like there'll no, be no. there'll be listeners who don't know who David Batty is. I think now. Isn't Emory that, Batty. Isn't that a chastening thought. <laughs> well, uh, listener, if, if you're not if you're not aware, this is a great opportunity for you to read up on part of your football heritage. Uh, excellent, Seb. Anything else you want to uh, tell us about from this Bundesliga weekend? Maybe the magnificent Stuttgart, who did get the one nil win away to Juventus in the Champions League, continuing their good form with a two one win over Kiel. No, my time is limited, so I'm going to direct you instead to Nuremberg 8, Regensburg 3 wow. in the Zweite Bundesliga, which is exactly as it sounds. But notable also because um, Nuremberg are now coached by Miro Closer in ah. his first senior management job. Yeah, the World Cup's Miro Closer. Um, unfortunately, Regensburg uh, sacked their coach on Sunday morning, um, which yeah, kind of... If you concede eight times, I think. And if you if you watch the game and you see the quality of some of the defending and goalkeeping, you'll probably understand that decision. But right. sad nonetheless. But, Red uh, your side. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say great game of football, but we'll call it a spectacle. 
Magnificent, Seb. Well, listen, you enjoy your pressing appointment and I uh, hope the neighbours' uh, builders are kind. And we look forward to catching up with you next week on the Totally Football Show. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Seb. Uh, yeah. And that brings us to the end of today's Totally Football Show. Yeah. Eh? yeah. Wow. Wunderbar. 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 So many delights await us over the weekend. Of course, we'll be back next week to bring you all the latest on those. Probably an earlier show next week, I'm yeah. thinking, because it's... It's back to the Champions League, isn't it? Is it? Right. Yeah, of wow. course. Back to the Champions League. You've got Inter Arsenal. You know Can't that. Wait. You're going too to Inter Arsenal. Are you yeah. Go? yeah. Are yeah. you going? No, no, no. Oh. I'll be on the BBC Highlight Show. Will you, Jules? Will you? Yeah. No. All right. Well, many thanks to you, Jules, for today. Thank you. Thanks earlier on to Paul and Seb and David and James Horncastle and Rachel and producer Lucy in the booth. You listener, above all, etc. and so on, are previewing the Premier League weekend. Loads to look forward to then. Keep it totally and we'll be with you again soon. The Totally Football Show podcast is available three times a week, bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about. We've got views, we've got stats, we've got analysis, we've got some of the best football writers around, and the whole thing is absolutely free. So have a listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below.